Good afternoon, everybody, for a, a deserted Hartford. Uh, glorious in the sunshine, really glorious. And uh, in fact, it's not quite deserted. If you listen very carefully, you can probably hear the tones of the organ. Uh, I went in just a few minutes ago and I was told firmly that the organ has to be played um, twice a week um, to comply with our insurance. Anyway, um, it's glorious here, but it is locked down. Um, there is no one here apart from me and the porter. Uh, and um, the, uh, we're going to launch Hartford Responds. Um, of course, it is week five. Normally, this would be um, uh, bustling with students preparing for finals. All, all our finalists are, are doing their finals open book online um, and knuckling down to it and where you were uh, where you unfortunate enough to be taking your finals this year and that's what you'll be doing too. Um, actually there I, I've met some already who report that um, actually they quite like it. Uh, they've worked they've worked hard they've written hard and they've, they think they've quitted themselves well so we'll see. But back to Hartford response and Professor Shui. Um, Shui is a fabulous engineer. Um, he's uh, of course he's Chinese and he, he, uh, he commutes as you'll tell you but in Suzhou uh, in China where he has a research center and here in Oxford. Um, it's part of a series. We thought that given the scale of the pandemic, given its global nature, um, that, and, and we've got a lot of intellectual and academic resource here in Hartford, let alone Oxford, that we should actually uh, try and contribute to the kind of national and international debate um, Testing, how to test, how kind of efficient it is, how reliable it is, is of course absolutely uh, you know, at the forefront of not just the national and European discussion, but the global discussion. Um, Shui and his team have um, kind of created a, um, a, a piece of testing equipment which is actually original and phenomenally interesting. So, with no more ado, let me hand over to Shui. Okay, good afternoon, good morning, good evening. No matter where you are, I hope you're all safe. And, uh, and uh, thank you all to join me. And it's quite a strange talking to the screen and just to see myself. And uh, okay, so I'm, uh, uh, let me put this uh, share screen. And uh, I'm a professor fellow in Hartford College. I join in the college. Uh, in to 20 years ago. So it has been 20 years in Hartford College. And probably many of the younger uh, alumni, you probably don't know me because I don't uh, teach. I don't actually give tutorial uh, as because I'm a professor or fellow. Okay, so I let me talking about uh, this uh, rapid case, Oxford rapid case, and the link to Oscar. This is actually, I, I just spend some time talking about the case and then say, give the story, where the story came from. I guess everybody now listens to the news, always test, test, test. But actually what we are testing for and what we're testing and what they are for. Basically there are two types of tests and the one is a viral RNA test. This is what you see on television, take a swab, and the test, this is a test the individual whether it's infected or still infectious. Basically, whether you get the virus or not. So if you got a virus, then stay home, isolation, and control the spread of the disease, very, very direct. So this is very important for the stage of the reopening. And the other type of test is a so-called antibody test. This is a test the individual where they got infected before, or maybe still, are already recovered. So it's just to say whether the people, it was believed that if actually the individual got antibody, they are protected. So if that is the case, they can come back to work. But now there's a very evident to show may not be the case. So it's still uh, confusing the science progress, not so fast as we, as we wished. But the uh, antibody test does provide indication how many people actually affected through this last few weeks or last few months. 
So then what we developed the test is actually the anti, so-called, some, some people call it antigen test, actually it's a virus test, just a test whether the individual got a virus. So what it tested now, if you see the government say we are testing 100,000 people or 200,000 people, so at the moment, this is how it's done, is take a sample, take a, this is actually take a so-called swab, either nasal or throat, take a sample, and they put it into this little tube, and this collected, and then transported to the test, test centers, to the hospital and the test centers. So in the test center, these samples will be processed. So you standard way is to extract the RNA because this Corona-19 virus is actually a enveloped RNA virus. So you get the RNA out, and then use all these complicated machines, but they are actually all automated. All automatic is actually is when you get to the lab, the proper equipped lab, and then it's quite straightforward. They actually extract DNA and they put a so-called RT-PCR machine. This is give you uh, put it there. It run for ninety to two hour, ninety minutes or two hours. Then you get the results, whether it's positive or negative. So the results, we will go back, release the results. That's actually what has been doing. This is like gold standard, but it doesn't need a lab facility because these samples potentially infectious. They need to be in a controlled lab, so-called the biological safety level three laboratory. And uh, then you need this, all these fancy machines. So if for a rich place, rich place, rich country, rich law. And then you have this free infrastructure, then the test is not an issue. But then the problem is, is run out of consumables because they all competing, all the national centers, international test centers, they all competing with same consumables, the same reagent. So it's a run out of reagent. So it's a lot of these uh, issues that say, uh, this test. But then the important one is you need to collect the sample and the transport send it to the hospital. So at the moment, people say you got results in 48 hours or sometimes get results over a week. So this is why, this is why we need a test we can do on site. Basically, when you need it, so-called point of care, we just tested ourselves at the sports. So this is what we developed, this test, okay? So it's basically very, really looks very simple and economical, it's not that expensive, not that fancy. So we start with a swab, with, this is what we have been doing, and then you don't need to take the transport of the samples anymore. You take, we directly put this test tube, this is all the reagent put in the test tube. And then we simply heat up the test tube to 65 degrees centigrade. So this can be heated up with so-called heat, heating block, this is like in a GP clinic or a test centers. You can have this little test heaters, just set it to 65 degrees, 30 minutes, and then the results come out. And then, or we actually can simply use hot water, use a thermal flask, and set the temperature on 65. If you can measure it in the kitchen, you have the thermometer. If you don't, just adding two parts of cold water, type of water, three parts of boiling water, that gave you about 65, 67 degrees, and that's good enough. So after 30 minutes, what you need to just look at the color. Initially it's all pink, like this come with pink. If still remain as pink, then you just, that's negative, there's no virus, okay? So if it's turned into yellow, then that's got the virus. So that is, is so that's the, how the test is done. So from the swab, we take a little bit of solution, 25 microliter of solution from the swab tube, adding into the test tube, heating it up to 65 degrees for 30 minutes. If the color changes to yellow, that's positive. And the test tube is very small. This is a standard PCR tube. So you compare with the 10 pens, you see it's the same size, similar size with that. This is quite small. Now this can be done, of course, in GP clinic, in people return to work, school, hospital, and then you can also test at home. 
So same thing, we can take the sample, and then at the moment we do another one, is to do a clinical trial at the moment, is use saliva. So in this way, you, because taking samples in swab, either nasal or throat, it's not that easy, and it's not comfortable, certainly. So that's why we are looking into using saliva and to do the test. And you just put hot water, you just put two drops of this into the test tube, and 30 minutes later, you just look at the color change. So yellow, positive, you got virus, pink is a, a negative. Then you may say, okay, how could I tell? Sometimes it's a very obvious pink or a yellow, sometimes orange, or what the color, if there's different lighting, my eyesight, all these things. So we provide some help. So we actually developing an APP, you can take a picture and uh, the worst the APP will tell you the, the color and they tell you the test results. And then if necessary, you can send the picture to, 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 to us, then for somebody can look into that. So that's actually is uh, uh, how it can be done. So it is really, you see, you look at that, it's not fancy signs, but then we want to make it cheap. We want to make it easy to use. We want to make everybody can use it. That's the whole thing. Uh, whole idea. But then you may ask, it looks so cheap. It does it work. That's of course is more important. So then what is the clinical performance so far we have done? Basically we've done a lot of clinical trials. Uh, it's done in Oxford and there's a, one large trial in Watford uh, General Hospital. And then in Oxford we've done in John Radcliffe Hospital and the Down School of Pathology, Moldova Institute of Virology. And we did uh, quite a number of tests in China. They initially, we did that in China. Uh, and then, so we did all this for the RNA test, and then also the direct swap test. This is for home use. So it's all actually gave you over 90% accuracy. And, uh, and then, so particularly for the, uh, I think you see, this is what we really worry is a false negative. If you get the people actually is not, no virus, uh, false negative, people get the virus and then did, did not show. And the other person, for example, passing airport control, border control, then that may infect other people. So we discussed with uh, various uh, professional people and uh, actually this work led by uh, Dr. Monique Anderson in John Radcliffe Hospital on the clinical side. And uh, so they are all overwhelmed with results. This is actually, this is fantastic. So we are now applying uh, the trial at the moment. Uh, no, not trial, we are doing, the, we already finished some trial. We're doing a large scale trial for different applications. We are applying regulatory approval at the moment. And uh, so this is uh, uh, then the reason we delay, we couldn't, we, so far we haven't applied regulatory approval because we couldn't do it. And then we contacted the, the uh, regulatory approval bodies, they simply say, you are university, this is not your job. We don't, you can't provide us million test kits. So we, we need to deal with company. So that's why you see we can't, they don't accept our, basically don't deal with our application. So University Oxford, uh, Oxford University Innovation, that's our technology transfer company. And they now try to set, is in the process, I think about, we will finish all the paperwork this week to set up so-called social venture. It's a company not just for profit, with the main uh, mission is for social impact. So that is actually to set up a company. So this company called Oxid will actually apply for regulatory approval and the commercialization because we have the patent, we have know-how, so this can go to uh, this uh, commercialization platform. During the pandemic, uh, Oxford University will offer non-exclusive minimum cost, zero free, uh, zero fee, zero royalty free license to manufacture to partners and to make and to license and develop technology related to the COVID-19. So we are also looking for international partners to bring this to different territory because this is a global issue. And then you see all this uh, different part of the people is all related to uh, test. 
and control people the ugly movement. So we had a request from a holiday resort island. They said that we have to open it because otherwise we will the business will die. And but we like to offer tests to everybody before they land to the island. So this type of scenario, a lot of applications. So that is actually basically the what is a test. I think I would like to brief enough to give you a demonstration and to see how easy this can be done. I haven't done this before, and, uh, but I, I think it would be very useful to give it a try. So the test tube, the real test tube is very, very small. So I get one for the, in the lab. So this is actually the, the test tube like this, very, very small, okay? And so I have sampling tube. This is for the sample. And this is, I need a, a thermal flask. Shui, we need you to, uh, we need you to clear your, your oh, we can, I can't, I, we, now we can see you. Okay. It'd, it'd be good to clear the screen of the uh, presentation. Oh yes, all right. Okay, let's do that now. I stop sharing, we go back, thank you. That's prob oh, that is a bit better. Now I will change the angle then. Let's do that. It will save me there. I will try. Give it a try. This is actually not a not a fun, not a uh, robot science. So here I got hot water in a thermal flask. So you can get two parts of boiling water, three parts of boiling water, two parts of tap water. That's gave you about 65, 67, 65, 67 degrees. Here I put a thermometer because I mean the lab have it. So that show about, it should get it to, because I prepared this a moment ago. Okay, so this is a 60, it's still going up. So that's give you, it should give me 65. Okay, you have to trust me, that's a 65. But it's come out, of course, you can't see it anymore, temperature drop. So now this, what, this is the sampling tube provided. So what do you do? You put one milliliter of water, any water, for, the, for this water we'll do. I just put this, okay? This is one millimeter of water, one milliliter of water. I put in test tube. This is ready. Now, this is a difficult part. So this, uh, you can use nasal swab our throat swab is actually not, none of them is easy to do it itself. So why, I, why we like to promote self-test? Because self-test, you, you don't need to worry about, in fact, other people. You can do it yourself. In case you are positive, you test positive, you don't worry about, uh, in fact, other people. So uh, this is, uh, can be done. So this is a nasal swab, okay? So I gave it a try. So we just put it in and then go. It's not comfortable because it's actually. Um, okay, so in theory, it should go to very deep, but there is a scientific, scientific paper that you don't need to go to so deep, you can get it to the, touch the bone and the, what you collect there is okay. So you get it there, you stay there and it will turn a bit and then you can get it out. And so this put into the tube, you just break this part, this can break. Now, where's the cup? So you can see my tears come out because it's actually not comfortable to do this. This is why we are developing tests, use saliva, because you can collect your saliva, it's much easier. But then if you just had a cup of coffee, have a gin and tonic, and then your results will not be accurate. So this is actually put in the swab tube in it. We have one millimeter water. We shake it, okay? Give it a shake for five times, okay? And this is shake, shake it five times. Now, what I do is, this is my, this is test tube. It's pink color. This is actually come out from my lab. So we open that. This is not toxic. So don't worry about whether you got poisoned or not. So I just take this solution with the swab. Don't worry about swab anymore. We just take this swab, this take solution. We just take the solution. I just need two drops, okay? One, two small drops. One, two. 
So I got to do this. I put this one is no longer used. I don't need it anymore. So I cover that firmly, cover it up. And it says, you can see there's some water in it. And on the bottom is the, the pink reagent. OK? This is done. Now, put it here in the thermal flask. Don't worry about it now. Close it up, close lid. I'm back to talking with you. So 30 minutes later, I will just check whether I got a virus or not. But if, I do, if you don't see me next two weeks, so I probably have it. I think that's all for the test. And I hope you, you, this is how easy it can be done. And then it would be a fraction of the cost for the current uh, method. And it doesn't use the same reagent that consumables, so it does not compete with the same test. Right, so that's about the test. So let me bring back the screen, and then I can actually, so I will just say, right. Now, is there anything to do with the international collaboration? Oh, this is my next topic, right? So this project actually started in China. Now I run a center, this I will come a few slides on, called OSCA. It's Oxford Suzhou Center for Advanced Research. It is 100% owned by the University of Oxford. And uh, then is R&D Center. And uh, then we are, uh, I come to that, we, are about, we are employ about 60 people at the moment. You see, 25th of January is Chinese New Year. Then before that, and then our people will come back. You see, if you're looking at the, but then on the later January from, from about 18th, a week before, and our Oscar people, there was quite a number of people leaving Oxford, they were leaving in UK, and uh, because of China, Chinese New Year is a holiday, so people coming back. But at that time, China already have a lot of cases. Uh, particularly, we have few people come back on 24th on the Chinese New Year Eve. And that's after Wuhan lockdown. Wuhan lockdown 23rd of January. And then, of course, in China, everybody is in high alert. But when our people passing his role, there's no test. There's no question to ask. Even nobody asks any questions. Then, of course, in China, everybody just got scared. And then we said, oh, my God, we need to do something. It would be good at the airport when you're passing immigration, you have this test. Because that is a very efficient way to test this uh, uh, spread, the control spread. So that's where we started. So just on the Chinese New Year, you see that day. So I, I, I got a couple of people. So in this picture, this is the Professor Huang, Wei Huang. He is also a PI in Oscar, and the other two are senior, senior scientists. They were all living in Oxford. And uh, we said that we needed to do something. What we can do? We are not a medic. We can't develop vaccines. So, but we have some experience on uh, molecular biology and uh, in virtual diagnostics and bioengineering. We said, let's develop a test, test. Just initially, we just said, just a useful airport so for that type of scenario. That's how we started. And then, of course, the China, uh, uh, and then the department is very supportive. So we actually get more people. So in the mid, this is actually our group, people working on this project. We got the postdocs and students to join us. And then later, the Oscar uh, people also start to work. So, and then we have people there in Suzhou working on the project. So if you're looking at this timeline, the UK, we have about two months, this lockdown, this all the pandemic, two months after China. So when we started in January, we cannot do anything in China, in Oscar. But then we can get access, all the equipment that we buy, consumables, everything is working as normal, full speed. So we have about two months of time compared to China, uh, Chinese scientists. So we have this two months, we can work on that. When the, this side got uh, locked down, although we have permitted to work because we're working on this project, and, uh, but then buying consumables, 
try to get various kinds of uh, equipment, it's all become co more complicated. But then from 19th of February, our Oscar Center back to work. So our team, people in Oscar, start to working on the project for full gear up. So we actually, through these two uh, scientific base, bases, then we, our research never gets hindered. So this is why we compare to many other groups, we have this few weeks advantage and ahead of other people. So then I will say a few words, a few slides about the introduced Oscar, because actually uh, this is a relatively new thing. It's the very first research center outside the Oxford Ring Road uh, in science and technology. So this project initiated in 2012. So, and then signed that because some, some the pseudo government said that we like to get more universities coming. We like to get some new uh, uh, top university. Can you actually consider to set something there, Oxford University? I said, look, you can, you can try, but then it's very difficult. But then that's why we started. But the, in April 2013, the Vice Chancellor then, uh, Professor Hammond, uh, Andrew Hamilton, uh, signed the MOU. But it take another near five years, and then finally we got this center up and running. And then, so this is our current Vice Chancellor, Professor uh, Louis Richardson, went to Sudo. This is uh, in 2018, that's a Thanksgiving Day, and uh, we had a grand opening. So it's a physical center, we have, uh, we have actually quite a big uh, building. We have actually 20,000 square meter building. Now, how big is that? I guess you all know Oxford City Center, we have the most, the tallest building. A lot of people say it's the ugly, most ugly building, but it's, that's as our engineering building, right? Palm building. And that one is a 10,000 square meter uh, floor space. So this building in Suzhou Industry Park for our Oscar Center is double that size. So we have actually, we like to produce, uh, create a forward looking Oxford image. Because I, if you go to China, you ask people, what do they know about Oxford? Oh, it's old. Uh, you have a lot of prime ministers. And the next thing probably is a dictionary. Everybody now use Oxford dictionary. Next thing is Harry Potter. Then they, the science and technology, and this, this is not well, uh, well, it's basically people don't uh, uh, know much. And then all we think we are very old, we are very conservative uh, in small C. And so then what we said, we like to create a showcase, Oxford, Oxford is forward looking. So this is actually when we designed even the reception, this kind of showcase, time tunnel, people come here, we use the, the most advanced technology actually, and uh, to, to show Oxford history and now and the scientific achievement. So we have a good uh, facility for conferences, for training, and, uh, and, then, so, and then particularly the labs, of course is for R&D lab. So and the, all, every PI is quite uh, amazed to get that space. And uh, of course the Oxford, the main limitation to us is space. So this offered a great opportunity. And the most important thing is that one of the re main reason we set this up in Suzhou Industry Park is to access under uses. Because there are, uh, uh, I think there's uh, 50 or 60 uh, Fortune 100 companies in SIP, Suzhou Industry Park. So it's Suzhou is, in politically is a third tier city, but in China, in terms of GDP, is in top five. So it's a very strong industrial base, a manufacturer base. That's why we set up this uh, in Suzhou. So this is actually the building in each floor. We said we gave a name for each floor, but the more important thing is that the research and activity is led by Oxford professors. So all the PI are full-time Oxford professors, okay? And it is all from MPLS division at the moment. We try to open to other divisions slowly. And we have four themes, biomedical engineering and healthcare, environment and biotechnology, 
nanotechnology and functional materials, uh, quantitative finance. So at the moment we have probably around 50 uh, researchers employed locally, uh, very international at the moment from seven countries, uh, 10 admin supporting staff. But the key important thing is basically it's wholly owned by Oxford University. It run like Oxford Academic Unit. So we have this slogan, so future of science is global. So that's actually, we try to make this as a showcase for international collaboration. And uh, this test case I just presented is actually is the re as a result of this international collaboration. If we didn't have Oscar, probably we just have uh, working as normal as like everybody else. Because we have this Oscar, we have the Chinese base. So we have this two months in advance to get grip of the problem and to get some critical data with the, our Chinese collaborators and access to Chinese hospitals then to do the clinical validation because there's no, no uh, cases in the UK for that two months period of time. And then of course now China is, is under, the, the situation is under control, but this country, UK and other countries are in high alert and in high demand. So I, I hope I gave you this, uh, uh, present this story, you'll find it interesting. Uh, and then if you have chance, come to Suzhou and uh, China and do pay a visit to us. And then we are also trying to work out, with, with, uh, work out the scheme to have the college for training program and uh, to run training programs, for example, join the program uh, non-degree because we are not allowed to do degree related uh, academic work. So I think that's all for me and uh, thank you and uh, stay safe. <laughs> well done. Okay. Thank you, Shui. Um, I'm just trying to start my video so you can see me. Um, Sarah can start my video, yeah. I can see you, but you can't see me. Can okay. you hear me? Let me stop my video now, okay. Uh, okay. I'm starting my video. Um, yeah, um, you'll see me. I'm, I'm now, uh, ah, start my video, okay. Okay. Um, great, very interesting, very interesting presentation. And there's gonna be lots of questions in the, uh, uh, coming up to you in the Q&A session. I mean, um, one of the things that, um, uh, I mean, it's so kind of, <laughs> and all the best ideas are often very, simple ones but i mean it's a i mean um uh what is it about the reagent that allows you to bypass this extraordinarily complicated one and a half to two hour test that you uh i mean isn't it that uh, uh current sampling requires and, and testing requires what's the what's the key what's the key to the what is the key to this uh the the the, the, the cheapness and efficiency of this I think you see, uh, Will, that's a good question. Actually, the technology itself, the platform for this test is not new. It's actually 20 years old. It's 20 years ago, it's published by a group of Japanese scientists. But then it has not been widely adapted. The reason is that it's very difficult to deal with, to apply this uh, detection uh, technology because it's, uh, you may say it's very oversensitive. It's easy to get a lot of false positive. So this makes they react very fast because the, we want to get results quickly, right? They, the standard the PCR need like uh, 90 minutes to two hours because they control the DNA replication by heating it up, then to a stage, it cool it down, stop, and do again. So then the cable reaction well controlled. But this technology, we call the loop mediated isothermal amplification is LAMP. And uh, is quite uh, uh, react fast, but it is uh, difficult to control. So that's why when it started, you never know whether this is actually using your real target RNA or not. So we developed the technology to get the so-called primers and uh, to target the virus, only the virus, and also to switch the reaction. 
We own it only when we say, okay, now 65 degrees, then start your reaction. So that is actually uh, the know-how basically to make it work. Another important contribution we have made is actually to provide everything dried because if the eight reagent all premixed, so then because we can control the reaction, they don't react, then, then we can mix them and then we dry them. So we can post in the envelope. Most other reagent test case needed to use cold chain because you needed to keep in the uh, frozen. So that's basically our contribution. And uh, then to make adopt a format, not for fancy, not for, uh, you see, uh, and then try to make, the, the important thing to make it cheap is that everything I showed you is readily available in quantity. So it's all plastic, all these things, you see? It's the, if I bring, there's all the little tubes, this tubes, this pipettes, this is all very cheap. And then you can get this very, uh, get the cost of that. So what is the key to getting regulatory approval for this? What is uh, the key? What, what is the, I mean, you've got, to, you've got to show that your system doesn't show lots of false positives, presumably. Yeah, clinical, clinical validation, clinical data. Basically, you, we done a, experimentally, you can do it in the lab, but the key thing is clinical validation. So then you need to demonstrate, this is your test results, and this is the so-called the gold standard, RT-PCR, the test data, and then to see the correlation. And, and how far down the road are you for getting we, that? No, we believe we got sufficient data to do this uh, clinical, uh, to do regulatory approval now. So uh, basically the reason we haven't applied because we couldn't. Now we have this social venture and then like a commercial platform. Uh, and then we use that to apply. So in, in, if this everything worked out, probably in the next week or two, we can launch the product. And, and uh, the scale in which you seem to be able to do this is kind of, I mean, when, it, when you're doing vaccines, you're talking, you know, huge, um, uh, exercises in validation, but you, you, how many, what's the scale of the data that you require for your validation? Oh, this one does not need that much. It's basically in the, the advice we got, we always uh, consistently give us is about 100. You have 100 tests, you have a mixture of positive and the negative. So it's actually the standard clinical trial number of the test is 136. That's what they are using now. And I suppose unlike a vaccine, I mean, there's no kind of, there's no kind of risk to people. I mean, the, the, the risk is if, the, if, it, if it's a false positive or a false negative. That's but if, right. if, you, if you have a vaccine uh, that's going wrong, it can have, can have very, very adverse effects on your whole of your health, can't it? Yeah. Because this is a so-called in vitro diagnostic because it's outside the body. It's nothing to do in the body. So that's, is, uh, that's a regulation is quite, uh, is a different. It's not like a drug, basically. So how confident are you that you're going to get regulatory approval and, and once you get it, when, when we might be using this on the streets of Oxford, for example? I mean, it's Good going question, to be, because you're actually- You're in the hospital at the moment, aren't you? So when we, you're yeah. using it in the JR and the Churchill, I mean, that's the, is that the plan? Yeah, at the moment it's in JR to do all the trials, uh, to do all these clinical trials. And uh, then we actually, I'm already in discussion with the university. We like to offer the, to the university to test when the control the reopening of the buildings, we can actually uh, to test the, our student, our, our staff. And uh, then you see in terms of the accuracy is actually we are very, very confident because actually it's not a me confident. It doesn't matter whether how, mu how much confident I have. Is a medical colleagues, <laughs> because this is a good thing is that our medical uh, colleagues in general hospitals, they are really fired up and they are actually, uh, because it's actually, they need to use it. They just see this is the way to get rid of the national shortage, short, shortage of reagents and then to speed up the test. Because at the moment, a lot of time, 
spend down, collect the samples, and they transport the samples. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, could it could it have been even faster? Could the whole process have been faster? And how much? And I'll finish off and then hand over to Sarah because she can start collating the questions. But I mean, had we been given? Uh, I mean, you said that you've got a kind of, you know, a, uh, some weeks advance on the rest of the world because, of course, you have the Suzhou um, facility. Um, but I mean, to what extent uh, had had you been given the green light to get on with this? By, by both, I guess, the Chinese and, uh, and, and uh, British governments, could you have been faster? I mean, uh, was well, it as fast, I, as, as, I, as, as fast as it could have been? I, I actually, I, I need this. I will need the help, actually, if people can actually uh, get us connected to different NHS authorities, public primary care, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, big, because actually one of the, the big companies, they want to reopen. And then they won't test the, their, their stuff. And uh, yes, that's, the, but the more important thing actually, the next thing that this week, and this week our main, main work is to set up the social enterprise. And the next week is to identify large scale manufacturer uh, facilities, because we have to get the contractors to do large scale manufacture. I see, I mean, uh, and lastly, I mean, the, uh, um, I, I'm just kind of getting at, I mean, I mean, to to what extent has the um, kind of university been helpful? I mean, you know, do you, do you, I mean, can, can the university help? You know, you know, I mean, John Bell and others are got in close touch with um, both Sage and um, you know the various uh, kind of committees that are um, kind of running this and and implemented in government. So I mean, we do have the university does have. A capacity to uh, kind of make the powers that be aware of what you've got. I mean, are they doing it? Yes, they are. They are all helping us. They actually they are all aware of this. And uh, actually, um, Professor John Bell, you mentioned that he actually phoned me a couple of times. He said we needed to we needed to bring this to school because actually that's one of the school reopening. People worry about it, and uh, then a lot of primary care. Uh, you need also need that. So it's a, it's a, it's a, I think you see the university is well informed for this way. And because we are hoping, we are hoping, we're here at Hartford, we are going to go to the, the th you know, phase three um, <coughs> complete lockdown to just uh, a very, very, very partial easing of the lockdown on Monday of next week, of sixth week. And I know that some labs are opening around the university with 25% capacity. So, I mean, are you being prioritized in this or, or how is it working? Yes, we actually have been in discussion. Well, I have been working all the time, the lockdown period. We have a special piece of paper because uh, yeah. you see, we're working on this COVID-19 project. And uh, so it's uh, even busier in the last few months. And uh, yeah, we have been discussing with the university. And then we, we, we actually um, made it very clear we are in discussion is uh, to make, uh, to, to offer the case and uh, to, because actually one of the key issue, for example, in science and engineering, we have a Backbrook Science Park and there is a research student needed to take the minibus, go to the, uh, go to Backbrook. Then with that's one of the things in the minibus, when people get to, they don't have a private car, the student research student, then if they needed to go to work, they have to take the minibus. Then if we, so that's, I think if we have a, a screening for most of the people say, look, this is actually, um, you do a test. If you are clean, uh, if you're cleared, then you go back to work. Okay, I'll, I'll, that's very interesting. And uh, so there's a whole bunch of questions coming through in the q and I don't know whether, uh, right. I, I noticed one from um, Annette yeah. Mikes here. Um, but anyway, you, you, I'll hand over to you. Okay. Thank you. And thank you, Sri. That was amazing. So interesting. I actually had no idea, um, yeah, just sort of how, how interesting it is what you're doing. Um, so thanks so much for sharing it with us. And thank you as well for, for sharing it in um, very understandable terms. <laughs> I'm not, not much of a scientist myself, but uh, no, it's really interesting. Um, Will, shall I take your video off or do you want me to leave it on? As you choose. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to be... Uh, I, I'm happy to, well, you, 
you you get and you go ahead. You mean you be saying the questions? Okay. You go ahead. Exactly. Why don't you take me off this? Of, I'll, right, come yeah, I'll, I'll come listen. back at the end. I'll come back at the end. Okay. Fantastic. All right. Thanks, Will. Um, oh, there we go. I think if you there we go. Uh, so yeah, we've got quite a lot of questions rolling in. Um, so I'll just yeah I'll just run through. So first of all, um, from John Clark, uh, has the UK government or other gov um, governments decided to deploy your test yet? Uh, it's, uh, the answer is not yet, but they are made aware of it because we needed to get this regulatory approval. Mm -hmm. And uh, then actually, I would, basically, we, it's all chicken and egg. We needed this company, commercial platform, to apply for approval. And then, but they, it takes quite some time to set up this company, this platform. Uh, and even this is a, a fast, emergent, well, you see, green light approach. Okay. And uh, so-called the lean spin out, and uh, so, but the government uh, is made aware of this. So, but when we got the approval, we were told it's probably take a couple of days to get the emergency approved. But then that's, but then that's we'll test the water probably next week. Okay, um, and then the second part of the question is, how has the development of your test been financed? Especially, what support have you received from UK or other governments? This is actually a very good question. And uh, then I mentioned how important this international collaboration could be. One of them is the resources. Because you see, uh, to, to the you see all this, the first few months uh, is uh, from January, February to March. And the, all this is financed by Oscar Center, Research Center, that is actually in, ch the, in China. And uh, basically, because I'm the director, we had a quick press, uh, meeting we said, we do it, we just use resources, we have people. So we have this very able postdocs around, they couldn't go back to China, they are stuck in Oxford, and we have funding readily deployed. So we just use the Oscar funding to start the work here, use the laboratory, uh, use, uh, the laboratory here. And then later we get uh, uh, EPSRC funding, this the impact, uh, acceleration award. We got hundred thousand pounds for that. Uh, we got another university. The university recently gave us because the university got the COVID nineteen strategic fund. We got another thirty five thousand pounds to support clinical trials. So initially it's from China side, and then now it's mo mostly from the UK side. Okay, so real international collaboration with that as well. Um, and uh, if the reg uh, regulatory authority had approved the test swiftly, when might it have been available on scale? And I guess that's also to say when it is approved, how quickly will it be available on scale? No, well, I, I'm an optimi optimistic person always, I think optimistic. I, I think we should probably should get uh, approved uh, beginning or first, first half of June. And then this should be available later June. In oh, amazing! So quite quite quickly then. Because the manufacture is quite straightforward. There's not a, because all this consume. This is why we didn't go to fancy design because we could design a fancy uh, like a cartridge. You just insert the swab, put it into a fancy machine, all automated, automatic, get rid out. But then that take time to develop. So we all adopt the existing consumables and the readily available in large quantity, not expensive. We just package this. And the manufacture process is not that complicated. So we will identify large scale manufacturer. They can provide, the, the, the one told us they can provide us 100,000 100, kits per day and the manufacture capacity. But the way need, but the way need the money to pay the to pay the upfront. That's yeah. the manufacturer. So we actually need the money to do it. Okay, okay, that's yeah, amazing, amazingly <laughs> quick. Um, so a question from Annette Mikes. Um, congratulations again, three and team, on the rapid testing technology you have developed. Can you tell us about the challenges you're facing at this point? What types of help do you envision as necessary to remove the roadblocks, if any, or disseminate this testing technology successfully? Right. Thank you. And uh, yes, we do need the help. As always, we always need the help. So one thing, and the, our principal already mentioned, is actually to link to the high-level uh, users, like uh, 
uh, you see an NHS trust or a big companies, if they have a large number of employees, they want to come back to, to work. And also organizations then to potential uses. That is actually the important part. But that's secondary. The, the more important thing is that we, we need a fund. As I said, that we actually need, we a contractor simply said that we can make 100,000 kids per day for you, but you need to pay the upfront payment. You see? And then, so that is a cash, we will have a cash flow problem. We got set up this uh, spin out uh, social venture. We don't have any investment at the moment. We will borrow some money from the university, and the university said that you can borrow some money. And uh, then, of course, we, 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 we're looking for donations and uh, investment because this is social venture is not, the profit is not the top priority, but it is a business needed to survive. So we also accept investment as well. Okay. And uh, so if people uh, have, the, another important thing is that we, we're thinking about the social impact because this technology would be ideal or the more competitive for developing countries. When people actually, they don't have infrastructure, they don't have resources, and this will actually would be test very easily deployed. So if, you, if our uh, alumni get actually people in developing countries interesting to, to, to use this and to do bring the contact to us. Thank and you. that actually leads nicely onto a question from um, Freddie, which is, will this test have application in low and middle income countries? Yes, that's certainly because actually it's a, that's probably the more um, because you think of like take an example like the Germany, Germany when they do tests they have a lot of labs they just open the lab you just collect the sample locally testing, but then if you don't have the P3 lab a safe biological safety level three lab you don't have PCR machines the automatic robots to handle these samples hundreds of thousands of samples then you got stuck. So that's why we actually, for the developing countries, uh, probably you, you have more um, benefit, so more social impact. Mm -hmm. That's really, really interesting. Um, Professor Sweet, this is from an anonymous attendee. How do you feel about the UK's response to COVID-19? Uh, I think this is, I'm a scientist. I'm, a, I, I'm an engineer, but I, when I, I'm talking to scientists, I said I'm an engineer. Talking to engineers, I said I'm a scientist. And then actually, it's all experiment. Because this thing is actually, nobody knows what is actually the right approach or wrong approach. You see, it's actually, I think the UK government is doing social experiments. Uh, American doing their, their, uh, doing their experiment, the China doing their own experiment. All different. Uh, different uh, countries is try a different approach. It's actually which is the best or which is the better is remain to be seen. I think it's only maybe 20, 10 years, 20 years later, we can tell, I wish, uh, we wish we did that way or that different way. But I think it's actually very difficult because the one of the main reason is that so little is known about this virus. You see, initially we said actually, Normally, when people get infected, when they got antibodies, then they are immune for further infection. And then you just test the people's antibody. If they got antibody already, then fine, you don't need to worry about it anymore. But now for this virus, it seems it's not that straightforward. And so the, I think this is the main problem. We are so little is known. So that's, a, I think it's very difficult to see uh, which is good, which is bad. And also there's a huge cultural uh, difference between like China and the Korea, Hong Kong, and, uh, and here. Because I actually people quite often did not say much about Hong Kong. I always take us as Korea as an example. South Korea says uh, so few people died. Actually Hong Kong in this, uh, very, very successful. And the, the death rate in Hong Kong is very, very low. So it's a quite a different, it's different, difficult to say which is good, which is bad. Yeah, I certainly agree. I think it's going to be interesting looking back on this and, and seeing um, the implications of, of each country's approach. Yeah, um, if you got actually a very strict lockdown and the later have a second wave come back, then you see this is, it's, it's very difficult. I, I, I think you see it's a, 
is also not my expertise area. <laughs> my it's all, all speculation. <laughs> um, and a similar sort of question. Um, do you think the virus has spread rapidly in Europe due to an aging population? I don't know, actually. I think that uh, certainly, uh, I, I think this uh, uh, seems, uh, anyway, if for age the society, there will be a lot of problems because actually my main research is not about virus detection, not about the diagnostics. My main research is looking for regenerative medicine, stem cell therapy and tissue engineering. And one of the main problem is to degeneration, you see, aging society, degeneration, degenerative diseases. And then when we got old, we are not so strong anymore. We actually, the immune system got impaired. And then all this, we are not so strong against the virus anymore. And uh, so this particular virus seems um, target the older people. Older people get the response more. This is different from SARS-1 because the, old, the SARS-1, actually a lot of young people died. The stronger your immune system and uh, you got a more severe uh, symptom. And this one seems different. So I think certainly the aging society uh, will cause, will get a more issues because the people more, uh, I think you see, uh, I, I think now that if you're thinking about the how, why is it so fast to spread, uh, is a, this is a, one of the issues I think is uh, uh, about the globalization. Now is people travel so much, so freely. And uh, I think after this pandemic, probably people, we have to think about this travel and uh, do we need to travel so much? Now we can, you see this meeting, this discussion mm. working perfectly well. And that actually, again, segues nicely into another question, um, which is more about um, international collaboration. Will the fact that we're increasingly comfortable using technology mean that we'll see more international academic collaborations? I think, yes, that's, I, I think that is really uh, true because actually the world gets much smaller. Uh, when I first came to this country uh, in 88, and then you, write, you send, a, uh, send a letter to China to my wife, it take about um, three weeks to get to China. And then when I saved enough money, you try to make a phone call to her, and then you get a big pocket of one pound uh, coin standing on the machine, just to put the one pound, one pound, one pound, and then to make a conversation. So nowadays, of course, it's all changed. So I think it is certainly the world is much smaller. And this international collaboration will speed up a lot of uh, scientific technology progresses. Mm -hmm. And that's certainly the case. Um, question here that I think everyone wants to know the answer to. Do you see things returning to normal this year? Well, I have to, let me make a move because my lightning is new. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> and uh, as the answer is, how you define normal? Now we're living in the, the abnormal is normal now. I think <laughs> it's, I think you see, um, if you're looking at, uh, um, for travel, for example, international travel, probably this year would be very, very difficult back to origin, back before uh, the situation pandemic. And uh, I think you see um, for, if we got social distancing, this distance in place and the regular check in place, so you may say it's, it's not normal at all. It's still not normal because you're looking at in China now uh, and then uh, we couldn't go to China because actually, uh, they, I don't think they opened the border yet. If you are not uh, with a Chinese passport, you have to have a very special reason you can go to China. And uh, then you're looking at our colleagues in Oscar. They are fully functioning. They are go to work like normal, but they just keep a little bit of distance among themselves. But the one important thing is the tracing. Everybody is in China because you've got, uh, I think the uh, people simply accept that. So you got your mobile phone, got a QR code. So you go to anywhere, go to the bus, go to the train, and then you have to scan that. So then, so your whereabout is the transparent. So is everybody basically your whereabout is known to uh, people can trace you. So if you think that is normal, because I'm a part of that, 
they tell me it's all normal, but then you just need to keep people scan your QR code. And uh, so that's, that's what they are now. But I think you see certainly uh, before probably September, it will be very difficult to for international travel. But I think the bigger test is actually September, October time, whether our international students can come back to Oxford. Yeah. That is actually the big, uh, that would be a bigger issue. Um, and so some more test related questions. Um, we've got quite a lot to get through, so I'll sort of try and do it a bit quick fire. Um, so another one from Annette Mikes, how often would we need to test students and staff to ensure the easing of lockdown rules, for example, at schools and universities? Some say testing and tracing need to go hand in hand. How do you envision we could um, operationalize this testing process in general? Well, the question, unfortunately, I don't know. I don't know the answer because that's related to the, how the people behave, who they contact. But I would say certainly it's not just a one test for all, right? You, you just test once, you don't need to worry about it. So it has to be repeated the test. And then how often that remains to be seen? Because you see every week or every two weeks, and this all depends on the people, how they interact. So this tracing part is quite important. Mm -hmm. But then I know is a lot of people may not accept this is, a, you see, intruded the privacy. And uh, this is, again, is a cultural difference. In China, they said, that, yes, that is done, and uh, you're done, otherwise you stay home. And, uh, and uh, then here you have to persuade the people to, to, to actually uh, take this on, basically. Mm -hmm. So I guess that'll be something we I don't know. <laughs> because <laughs> today is, is, is actually negative. But if I go out to meet somebody who is uh, positive, then you see all these things <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we've got, yeah, you should know the answer to these ones. They're more specifically about your test. Um, does it matter for your validation whether people tested asymptomatic or not? Uh, uh, no, because actually what we are, because this is actually another thing, the uh, important part is actually a lot of people, certainly uh, they experience in China, and uh, they don't have any symptom. And uh, so they actually, but then they test the, this virus as a, as a carrier of the virus. So that is actually needed to be, to be sorted, to be tested. But this test, because it tests the virus uh, directly, then that can be uh, tested. Okay, um, and if the OSCAR test is approved successfully, is it likely to replace the current RT-PCR test or will it be com complementary to it? That's a question from Paul Bathay. I think it, it is complementary uh, because there's advantage and disadvantages. Our test is very easy to deploy to the remote areas, so they're like a GP clinic, a nursing home. When people wait, you can get the results. But if you really want to deal with, say, 100,000 tests per day, for example, then this, you have to use this distributed network. So a lot of people self-test, that's fine. But if you want to actually get this actually centralized, so-called high throughput, then that's what the central laboratories say they are good at, because they have all the robotics. They come along as all this highly invested infrastructure then that can be done rapidly. And uh, so that is, uh, and the other thing is that uh, if you want to keep the samples of the test samples for future research, then the central laboratory, when they collect all the samples, hundreds of thousands of them, then they keep it. Then later you want to do research, you want to tracing back. Then that's the, uh, the, where it's very important. And for our test, Usually we just say we just disposed then because that's I think you see is complementary. We don't aim to replace. Okay. <laughs> um, so a technical question from Stephen Greenwald. You mentioned some uncertainty about the degree of color change if there is a positive result. How uncertain is this, and is there a simple way to quantify or calibrate it? Well, it's actually the the, the uncertainty is come from two two. Um, aspect. One is very low, viral load. If this individual gets a lot of virus, then the viral load is high, then 15 minutes you actually color change. There's no, no uncertainty at all. 
And then even the very load is low and the towards get to the detection limit is very low. The so color change is not so obvious. It's still change. For our people, our team, when they saw the color, they said, that, yes, this is a half virus, half the virus. But then it's actually not complete to yellow yet, but it's become orange. And then the, the uncertainty, that's one thing, very low. But to us, it really doesn't matter if it's no longer pink, slightly color change, that shows that you have virus. But the uncertainty comes from different naked eye. Because I look at this, I said that this is pink. And you say, no, 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 that's not pink. And so that is something, um, you, 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 because if you think about the different people, people get the color weak, weak uh, uh, color blind, and all these different cases. So the solution is that we develop an app, APP, in the mobile phone, uh, just to take a picture. And then they got the internal calculation, and then you have a background self-calibration. Then you get the, just to tell you, yes, you got a virus or not. Okay, and do you know when that app will be available? Probably, well, I think we are developing that. And uh, we probably get the red, because actually, when we deploy the test the kids, we have we, we plan to launch the APP as well. Okay, perfect. Um, a question from Paul Wallage here: Will this tester work if COVID nineteen mutates significantly? Say it again. Retain. Will the test still work if COVID nineteen mutates significantly? Right. Yes, that's a good, very good question because actually, is a, this is a, is a, how you define significant. And that's the main thing, because when we design this uh, uh, primers, try to target the virus, and we design uh, three different regions to target that, uh, the conserved region, and also the mutable region. And this is really to considering uh, when they have mutations, we still be able to, to, to test it. Uh, I think it's good or bad, so far we haven't seen uh, big mutations so far, so and we we so that question still remain to be tested. We don't know the answer, but we hope it will work. Okay, um, can we get an idea of the price point for one test kit when it becomes available? Uh, at the moment, uh, as we actually initially we thought it's actually estimated as about twenty dollars, twenty pounds, and then now we think we can make it ten. Okay, so pretty yeah, cheap. Yeah, that's exactly we. That's what we target. Okay. But this is when we're talking to large scale manufacturers. That's what we said. Okay, can you make it so cheap? <laughs> <laughs> um, a question from Lindsay Forbes: Are you aware of competing efforts in other countries or in other universities to develop rapid testing kits? And why would the big pharma companies not be developing a for profit version? Right. It's a quite, a, uh, again, it's a good question because the test is so important. Uh, everywhere, get the people actually develop a test kit. Actually, uh, you see in the UK, it's a couple of days ago, we have in the news, and there's a company in Gatwick and they develop a rapid test kit for the COVID-19. Uh, Indian, uh, Indian company just uh, re uh, launched the products not long ago, Abbott, the big uh, diagnostic company uh, had uh, already launched the products. And uh, yes, it's a lot of uh, this uh, different companies, different countries, or US also get uh, uh, companies working on this. And it's very, everybody try to rush into, uh, try to do something for this, uh, for, this, uh, for this pandemic. And the big farmers actually, they, they also working on it as well. And uh, we are working with one of the largest farmer pharmaceutical companies, they are evaluating our test uh, themselves. And uh, then even, I think is what uh, um, the, the challenge for the bigger pharmaceutical, bigger companies try to make profit, uh, if they actually put profit, is that we just don't know how big the market is after the pandemic, how long the pandemic, because we hope in next month is all gone. We don't need the test anymore. Then if you are actually investor, then you have to think about, okay, I put the money now, uh, before I 
get my money back, maybe this whole thing is gone. So this is actually when we're talking to the investors, uh, people want to support us. So we made it very clear that this is for the pandemic. If you're actually aiming for large financial return, probably uh, this will be a very high risk project. Uh, and, uh, but it looks like this, uh, this testing will be with us. The need for the test will be with us for a little bit longer, looks mm -hmm. like. And uh, so that is, uh, I think, is make financial investors more uh, interesting to them. Um, we've still got quite a few more questions for you, but what I'm going to do, because I'm aware some people might be needing to go, because we said that we'd be done by quarter past, is ask the very important question, is your sample ready yet? Our sample? Yes. Oh, <laughs> the, my the test that you just yeah. did. Right. I don't know how long it is. All right. <laughs> I, think it's, uh, I think it's been either 30 minutes. Good. Now, let me show you. Okay. <laughs> right. Open it up. Okay, so 65, right, where is that? I've got that. Okay, drop my phone. Right. I bring it back. Right, I don't know, can you see the color? Let me get the red. Can you see better? Light oh yeah, that looks quite reassuringly pink to me. It's a pink, isn't it? Yeah. Phew. I'm <laughs> safe. All right. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. Now, I think that would be very good, good uh, ending, right? Yes. Uh, I'm safe. Thank you for your concern. I'm okay. Yeah, safe for All another right. day. <laughs> yes, it's pink. Right. Definitely pink, yeah. All right. Good. That's it. Okay, um, well, we've, we've got a word. couple more questions, um, Shri, but do you want me to, um, what we can do is organize it so we can send them around in an email perhaps to people? Yes, I think that's yeah. what we do, because I, we could, you see, this is, we, we, could, uh, we could discuss for hours. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Um, so yeah, if we haven't answered your question yet, if you want to email the development office and we can get them to Shri and um, get an answer to you that way. Um, okay. I'll now bring Will back on and, uh, you can just wrap up. So there we go. <laughs> thank you so much, Shri. That was so interesting. All right, good. Thank you. Right, Shri. Thank you very much. Fascinating, okay. and uh, and actually, it's rather it's rather important for the university too. So thank you very much for that. And uh, um, yeah, I mean, the we're, we're we're hoping that we're going to be open the university um, uh, in the beginning of October, and actually, your um, your testing could be really quite uh, could be quite an important component of that. So thank you very much, um, and thank you for everyone who's been participating, and uh, and, and thank you, Sarah, for your very competent chairmanship. So or chairwomanship, I should say, or better still, chairship. So um, I shall kind of um, sign off, um, and we look forward to the next in the Hartford response. We'll be talking about artificial intelligence, contact tracing. We're talking about the global supply chains and globalization. We're talking about uh, what to do about financial, uh, how to ma manage risk. Um, and we're talking also about the opportunity to reboot um, the rewilding and the environmental arguments. Uh, and that's just for starters. So thank you all very much indeed. Thank you.